Hi. My name Hi. is Derek Wormsley. I am the editor of The Wire. Uh, every year we like to do uh, some talks up at Tusk. We come up here and we chat to some of the amazingly diverse lineup of people that Lee puts together for the festival each year and try and get a sense of what makes them tick a little bit. Um, some people who are some of the more distinctive artists out there and people who make things happen, uh, scene type people, etc. And today we've got Aaron Dilloway, who's certainly one of those, and we're going to be talking to him. Uh, tomorrow we've got Ashley Paul, which is going to be about 3 p.m. So, um, yeah, what, what you can expect, we're going to talk for a little bit and you might get some time for questions at the end, which might be fun. And we're going to have a bit of chat to Aaron about his work and all kinds of things and see where it goes, basically. So, for those that don't know, Aaron is based in Oberlin in Ohio. He's been in the Midwest most of his life. Uh, he makes music with synthesizers and tapes, probably other stuff too, but uh, sort of a bit of a master of those, you might say. Uh, he was in Wolf Eyes until about the mid-2000s, or roughly speaking, uh, whereupon he struck out on his own. He runs an important label called Hanson Records, who've released uh, things by Emeralds, Andrew WK, Blood Stereo, and many, many others for, for tw 20 years now, Hanson Records. Yeah. Wow. Didn't 90, celebrate 94 the... was the first release, yeah. Wow, fantastic. And he's also playing tonight at 8.15 right here. So we thought it'd be fun uh, to start with a video clip. So I'm gonna show you a video of Aaron in action. And we're gonna have a bit of a chat after that. So check this out.
I'm just going to keep this rolling a bit in the background and maybe we could talk a little bit. Oh. I'll just keep the volume a little bit there. Aaron, with, with people who work with tapes and stuff like that, it's often... Sorry about the camera work, by the way. That was uh, somewhere else. someone else. This was at uh, Lausanne Underground Film Festival, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. In 2014. Yep. Yeah, last year. I often think with people who work with tapes, it's quite hard to see what they're doing. So I was curious just to ask, what, what are you doing here? And, and why have you got that thing in your mouth? Um, well, the, uh, the, the two machines on the right and left, well, there's uh, eight track tape cartridges, uh, players under, on the bottom. But above those are uh, two uh, tape delays. And... Uh, I use those more as as loopers than than an actual delay, and I'll uh, cover up the erase heads and and grab sounds by pushing the tape up against the record head. And so that's what I was doing with. I had a metal box that I was hitting there at the beginning, and then the the in my mouth is a microphone. I'm just. Uh, getting uh, mouth sounds and I can control feedback with, and that's also running through the tape. Uh, so the sounds from the mouth go through all the tapes yeah. as well. Is, yeah. is kind of everything going through tape heads and the tape machines? Yeah. There? Okay, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> and it makes you laugh looking at yourself performing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Tell us a bit about when you, when did you start fooling around with eight-track recorders and uh, microphones in your mouth? What, what got you onto that? Um, what got me into playing with eight-track tapes is uh, my buddy got. We we were living at this house in Ann Arbor. This was about 1996, and uh, my buddy, we we were you know big record collectors, and we we both grew up with. Uh, my buddy Steve and I both grew up with eight tracks in the house, and uh, he came across an eight track player that recorded, which I had never seen before. So he brought that to the house, and one night we were watching Kenneth Anger movies, and we watched Invocation of My Demon Brother, which has a Moog synthesizer soundtrack by Mick Jagger. Right. And the, the, the repetitiveness, these, these, loop sounds he was getting with this modular synth really I, I really latched onto it and uh, wanted to be able to make something similar and I, I had a Moog Rogue at the time and uh, but that, that that's you know made a bit different than the modular synths I couldn't get those looping sounds out of it that I was trying to get so I, I cracked open an 8 track tape and made a very small loop and then recorded my own synth sounds onto the eight track cartridge. And uh, then I started uh, you know, using delay effects and stuff to give the, the loops some movement. And, and uh, then I noticed, started noticing, because you know, I, was, I was just learning how to splice tape and 
I'd make really crude splices and the tape would get caught or it'd, and I really liked the inconsistency of the loops. Um, and these like little, it must be like two second or even less. Uh, yeah, it's short. It's, right, right. yeah, most of them. Um, but, uh, and then, then after leaving, you know, I'd use these tapes for months and months and then after time they just keep degrading and changing. And I really liked that decay aspect of it too. And I, I just kept playing with them and experimenting with different things I could do. And yeah, that's kind of been my main instrument for almost 20 years yeah, now. Yeah, a long running instrument. It's, you know, it's, after 20 years, you probably explored a lot of sort of permutations of that. Yeah, there's still a lot of things that I, I want to do, but I need like a electrical engineer for. And I, there's a couple things I've been wanting to make with it, but uh, over the years, I've, I've had bad luck with finding someone who could make exactly what I wanted to. So if there's anyone out there... What, <laughs> what is it you want to... I mean, basically, I want to. I, I mean, basically, I want to make a a very crude Mellotron. Oh. Um, but everyone uh, wants to yeah, make yeah, a Mellotron. Yeah, but I have I have these machines that are like. Uh, well, I don't I don't need to go all into it, but that's. Someone should give you some arts money for that for an eight track Mellotron. Please, that would yeah, be please. Great. <laughs> With eight track cartridges, I mean, they're you know eight track or whatever. Do you have some sort of primitive stereo thing you can mess yeah well with well what it is so. is there's four stereo tracks on the tape and so you have you know the the, the four stereo tracks lined up and then when you want to go to a different track the tape head the tape head actually moves down to get to it so I can have two different loops um, you know right and left and then I can pan them however I want but playing at a time. And usually I'll have multiple eight track machines so that I can mix the sounds in and out and they'll latch into each other at certain points and get off time. And, and at one point certainly you were, you were spending lots of time editing these kind of things together. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, most of it's pretty, pretty chance. I, I, lots of times I'll, uh, more now than, than when I first started, I almost always recorded my own sounds over the tapes. But um, about 10 years ago, I started, I was cutting up a Neil Diamond tape, and I, I got these loops I really loved out of it. And then I made a record with that called Concealed. And that's all, that's all Neil Diamond on that record. Okay. And so I've been doing that a bit more... Uh, uh, using whatever random sounds I find on them, if if they're, if I really like the loop, I'll leave it there. And, and uh, is it still pretty common to find eight-track recorders just kicking around in shops in the Midwest? Uh, or <laughs> what's going on here? This is <laughs> just you know, things no one wants to hear. That's, that's, um... Because there is a bit of a horror thing in your work as well. <laughs> well, this is... This was a tape cartridge I found that, uh... It, it, and this I didn't do anything to. This was a, uh, a cartridge that used to work in an old arcade machine, like in the 70s at some point. It has all these sound effects on it. Okay. And this one is, uh... It's a... There you can hear the. Oh, we'll get little Jimmy to start crying again. It's basically it would play this tape of a baby crying until you put a dollar in the machine and then it would stop. So it's this baby crying, and then this guy comes off you and like you want little Jimmy to stop crying, get your money out. That's, Anna. that's the hardest sound to ignore. You can't ignore yeah. that sound. Your brain is programmed to respond to that sound. And after, after playing this a few times and like talking to people about it, like I've noticed that parents usually think it's really funny and people without kids just can't handle it at all. 
You're just like, that's the fucking worst. A few is still pretty funny. Oh yeah, and then what I'm mixing in this the 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 eight track actually used all eight tracks, and what I'm mixing in now is uh this it's like a fake hair salon sound effect, and I don't know what that was used in the machine for, but it's it's got this you know just like mediocre rock band playing, and you can hear scissors and hair dryers and people answering the phones and amazing what you can pick up isn't it yeah for a while i tried to keep the the baby tape going until someone would actually throw money up to me but eventually the, i just in the venue i had i couldn't handle stop. it anymore yeah so i <laughs> You're quite well known for being a part of Wolf Eyes, and I, I think I'm right in saying you're, you've still got a sort of working relationship with some of those guys, or you've, be, you've been on some of their records in the last three, four, five years, something like that. Yeah, yeah, Nate and I are, are really close still, and, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe you could talk a bit about, about leaving them. You stopped working with them, like, or stopped being part of the group, as it were, about you know mid two thousand something like that. Yeah, two thousand five. Trip to Nepal, and I think I heard you had some sort of field recording thing, which you maybe did in Nepal of some Snake Charmer or something like that. Which yeah, yeah, was a, a release on Hanson, which was a really uh, ear catching release. But just sort of tell us a bit about why you why you left this group, this you know influential you know noise group, collective, whatever, and struck out on your own. What, what were you trying to do? What, were you, um, what, what itch were you scratching? Well, basically, I, I, it had gotten to a point, like we, we did the Burned Mind record for Sub Pop, and we're touring constantly. Like once we would get home, as soon as I'd get back in the groove of being at home, it'd be time to leave again. And I just, I got really sick of the touring and, uh, and just the whole, uh, like, larger independent uh, music world. I just didn't, you know, we'd have meetings and, uh, I don't know, something about working with a big label like that, I just... What's a meeting between Sub Pop and Wolf Eyes like? I mean, it was pretty, pretty relaxed, but it also, I kind of felt like I was at school. Sure. And I hated school. <laughs> so I don't know, it was, you know, how, how, how would you like us to market you and things like that? And I just, I, I didn't like that part of it. And, and, and so I was just a bit tired of the touring. And I mean, basically what, what it came down to was it wasn't a group of friends playing music together anymore it had become a job and you know I was getting ready to go my wife was going to Nepal to do field work and you know we had just put out Burn Mind we were getting asked to play all these places and uh and I'm like well I'm gonna leave the country for six months and uh go to Nepal and you know Nate and John were like well you know we're getting all these opportunities you know sure. you're you know this is kind of bad timing, and I'm like, well, sorry, you know. If, and that's where it kind of, uh, I realized that what we're doing, if what I wanted to do with my life was like uh, uh, holding them back, you know. So I was like, if you want to get somebody else to take my place, you know, go for it. And they picked our, our mutual buddy, Mike Connolly, sure. to take my place. And at the time, he seemed like the perfect person to do it. You know, I felt really comfortable with it. So you ended up back in the Midwest um, with your, your tapes and synthesizers and echoes and stuff like that. Were you, did you sort of sit down and think, right, I'm going to uh, create my own thing with you know, the, what I do with sound now? What, what, what did you sit down and try and uh, do? Um, I didn't really sit down and, and I, even during Wolf Eyes, I would play occasional solo concerts. And, and I really thought when I got back that maybe I'd put a new band together or something, but uh, uh, 
I just never got around to that. Nothing really came together, and I would just kept doing solo shows and kind of getting more into to working that way. You started working with synths and tapes together at some time, and you've talked a little bit about how you'd uh, work on stuff quite quite sort of painstakingly a little bit, like taking quite a lot of time to make a single album or stuff like that. I'm sure there's loads of people here who you know, work with tapes in any kind of way. It's, it's such a flexible medium. You can do a million, million different things with mm -hmm. it. When you're putting a piece together and you're editing it together, what do you, what do you look, when do you, when do you look at it and think, yeah, this is, this is done. I've, I've, I've finished this. This is a, this is a great bit of music. What, what do you look for when you're editing it together? Um, I don't know. I guess what kind of, uh, as, as long as it stays exciting to me, um, I guess. I, I, uh, I'm not quite sure. I just, it, I know when I get there, but sometimes I'm not always sure how to get there. And so I'm, it takes a lot of listening over and over to things. Okay. You know when you know. That's cool. Yeah. I'm curious a bit about Hanson. Were you pouring a bit of effort into your Hanson label at this time? Was It's always been notable with Hanson. It's drawing people from across the world a really wide range of artists end up on it, you know, people from the UK, et cetera, et cetera, beyond all, all bits of the US, et cetera. What was, what was happening with Hanson around the same time that you were striking out on your own? Um, let's see, I, we moved to, my wife got a job at Oberlin College, and so we moved to Oberlin, and I started hanging out with, more with my friends in Cleveland. And when I first moved there, the, the kind of underground music community was really diverse and uh, there were bands like Emeralds who at that time were kind of like more a, kind of a lo-fi drone band um, and then X like Skin Graft who's like really nasty harsh noise and bands like Tusco Terror who are like junk noise rock band, music, concrete, just crudeness. <laughs> and the shows were, were really, I, I really loved how diverse it was. It kind of reminded me of shows in Detroit and Ann Arbor in the mid-90s. And then... Uh, I just want to ask a quick question, yeah. which is when you see some pics of Midwest noise scene around that time, 2000s, often you'll see some pics of people, you know, jamming in the basement and... It looks, it looks kind of quite sort of sweaty, quite, you know, blokish, quite testosterone-ish in some ways, but it was really open as well in your experience. Yeah, I think so. It was, um, it was a weird, weird, uh, weird time. Uh, uh, weird how? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there was, there was a couple houses we all lived in, um, it's just a lot of musicians uh, and everyone working together. But yeah, it was it was mostly guys and uh, um, I don't know. Uh, Let me ask. A, I'm going to ask a sort of deliberately dumb question, which is at, at this stage, sort of you know mid mid two thousands was was. Was noise a thing? Were people saying, "Yeah, this is what I do. It, it is. It is noise." When when did people describing their music as that become a thing? When when did people actually sort of start describing their stuff as, as that? If if they ever happily did, I don't know. I I think. I mean, I, I think it kind of came to be kind of more written about and stuff around the time of the No Fun Fest. Sure. Um, but uh, I don't know if I could pinpoint a time. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it it ended up just being like a, a, a um the term used for many many different kinds of of music. I mean, it, you know, if, if and not even noise, you know. <laughs> so if, um... It got used just to, well, A, to refer to the scene, but also just to 
indicate there was a bit of an open door policy on what you could do? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't like, you know, when I think of noise, you think of the haters or something kind of just so, just straightly abstract and, uh, but yeah, it ended up getting used for many, just kind of, I guess as a term like punk or something. Just and, and this was a fun scene, there was a lot of, a lot of fun and a lot of, uh, you know, energetic, euphoric jams around this kind of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's um, play a little, a, a little bit of your music, if you don't mind, from slightly later. I'm going to play a bit of modern gesture and maybe we could chat about that. Okay. Just bear with me. This laptop is a little bit slow. You can um, direct your, direct your uh, complaints to the organizer of the festival. Okay. some pretty offensive noise there. He that's styling dishes out. One of our sponsors. <laughs> when is this from, Aaron? 2020, 2009, something like that? Mm. Maybe a little later than that. Called Modern Jester. That just goes on for about 15 minutes. <laughs> we'll just have a couple of minutes of this. Tell us, tell us what that, this is just some video someone's put up on, bunged up on YouTube as far as I know. What, what's, uh, but this picture has some sort of significance, hasn't it? What, who's, <laughs> whose mad face are we looking at there? Um, that's the goof. Uh, that's, that's a photo I, I found of a, a guy wearing a rubber mask in, sometime in the 50s. Uh, but, uh, I don't know, I kind of became obsessed with it and I was using it uh, 
even well before I, I used it as the album cover, it was kind of the logo for the label. Oh. And uh, then I'd been working on this, this record for a few years, and when it was finally finished, it was kind of the, seemed like the... Did the, you ever find out much about this mask, this photo? Um, I've, I've tried to find that exact one. I find, I've found variations of it. Um, oh. It goes back, the earliest thing I found was an ad for it, it from the 40s, it was called The Village Idiot. And uh, I found plastic versions of it and slightly different rubber versions of it, but I've never so you been able to find that exact order, one. order, The village, a village Idiot Mask or something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. But uh, when I was a little kid, one of the first times I remember ever being really frightened was... Uh, on a car ride with my brother and his friends, his, and my parents, my brother's friend, my brother is 10 years older than me. And I was sitting in the back seat and one of his friends was sitting in the front and said, hey Aaron. And I like went up to the front seat and he turned around and he had this rubber mask and scared the daylights out of me. And uh, How old are you? Was that? I don't know, I was probably four, five or or younger maybe, because then it was, it was years before I would even touch a rubber mask. I couldn't go down the, the, uh, the, the Halloween mask aisle at all. Um, and then I eventually uh, kind of fell in love with them and, and uh, horror movies and just, you, yeah. You've got kids now. Do you presumably don't scare them with masks when they're four years no. old? <laughs> no, no. No, there's there's lots of masks around the house though, and they uh, they're pretty into them. Any favorite masks you have? Um, my son got a really hideous swamp monster costume for Halloween a few years ago, and that it's a pretty terrifying mask. And that one's been around. My daughter wears it now. And um, actually, on the gatefold of of this record. There's a photo of my wife wearing the mask, and she's nursing my daughter. Um, the the swamp monster mask, yeah. So this piece is called um, <laughs> eight, eight eight cut scars yeah. for Robert de- Terman. Dedicated to Robert Terman. Maybe you could just say a couple of words about who he is. Um, Robert was a guy. When I first moved to Oberlin, I was selling records out of my house. I I was doing uh, mail order for experimental music, but my office and my house was set up like a a record shop. And this guy uh, emailed me saying, hey, uh, I'd like to come check out your shop. You know, when when can we meet? Robert Terman, I'm like, I know that name from somewhere. I'm like, what's... And so I look him up and he was the, the second member, the other guy in non, with Boyd Rice right. back in uh, 77. Um, he's only on that first uh, 45, well before, you know, things got weird with that before name. Boyd Rice got <laughs> flirtations with right-wing politics and yeah. so on. Yeah, I mean, Robert's not, he had nothing to do with that kind of thing. Uh, but it turns out he lived like three blocks from my house and but I, I wrote him back and I'm like I'm like oh you know you can come Monday at this time or this time if if you got an extra bring a copy of the knife ladder 45 with you and he was that he weirded him out because he's like how does this guy know what you know that is but and so we became good friends and started playing and together he makes some non is known for some quite you know uh, very in- intense sort of noise music in, in the uh, in sort of early days, but a lot of Robert Terman's music is really mellow, really reflective. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it is all, it's also all really loop-based, and um, he, he recorded, he would record things and not put them out, or just put them out, he'd make 10 copies for people and throughout the years, and, and he had a track um, on a on a cassette tape called uh, eight eight cut jump, and it was uh, a record that it and he he recorded this in '76, and it was a uh, uh, skipping records, 
And this was kind of my tribute to that, that track using eight track tapes. Or no, it was, his was called Four Cut Jump, sorry. And it was, yeah, it was four pieces of a record all glued back together and then skipping. It was all skips from that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what this one is. Okay. You mentioned a little bit about your shop. And you, you, have a, you sell records in the shop, you sell them online, you run Hanson Records and make your own music. I think a question that sometimes a lot of people are quite curious about is, well, what do you, you have all these strings to your bow, how, what do you do day to day? How do you, how do you sort of make it work, you know, how do you, how do you... <laughs> it's a struggle. <laughs> how do you, how do you struggle by? Um, you know, hanging out with my hilarious kids and my wife and, you know, okay. playing when I can, coming on long weekend trips like this and, yeah, that's how I keep myself sane and try to make it work. Okay. Obviously, I mean, Modern Jest is another take-based piece, basically. And you, you sort of made a, made a career, if that's the right word, or at least you've had a long engagement with using tape throughout the years and these, you know, discarded bits of equipment and so on. Mm -hmm. Give it another 10, 20 years, are you going to be making music with something else, with, I don't know, discarded hard drives or you know, <laughs> discarded memory sticks or something like that? Do you, I don't think so. I mean, I've never been... I, th I think the thing with the tapes is it's something I've, I've really been, felt connected with since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. I've never been a big computer guy. Um, so I don't, I mean, but who knows? I, I'm, I might get into, I might find something that really, you know, I, ne I never know. So I'm always open to change. How far can you take tapes apart from your cherished Mel Mellotron project? What, I don't where know. else are you going to take them? I, I, I think can, I can keep going for a while with them, I think. <laughs> I mean, people have been, uh, one of the first things that really blew my mind with uh, tapes, actually, can we bring that down a little bit? Um, is, uh, Does that was, just keep getting louder and louder and yeah. more hectic? <laughs> was uh, this piece by Henry Jacobs that's on this uh, Sound of New Music Folkways record. And it's about mid-90s. My, my buddy Steve, the guy who gave me the 8-track the recorder, he... Uh, he played me this record, and that has uh, Henry Jacobs doing a tape loop demonstration. I think it's around 1953. And it kind of blew my mind to think of how alien and strange that must have sounded at the time. I think we kind of take it for granted now. What um, did it sound like? Um, you know, he was, he was doing loops of, you know, changing the speeds and making loops from like tabla sounds and voice sounds and um, it's just these real minimal bear loops and just kind of trying to ta like put my head space, try to think of what that was like in 53, it kind of, it really blew my mind. In a, uh, we should say Henry Jacobs actually died recently, yeah. so he, he was sort of a humorist, humorist and tape collagist and yeah, so sort of I guess a bit of a, he's not really known that much over here, but he's um, sort of a bit of a renaissance man in a sense in the US. It's quite, as you say, it must be mind-blowing to hear this guy fooling with tapes at around that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did a lot of funny, funny stuff, like fake interviews with beatniks, and he'd put these radio, you know, collages together for the radio. And yeah, but still that, that first, that demo, he does just I can listen to that just over and over that's one of my favorite things to play for people when uh, we're listening to records at the house um, uh, one of the other things about tapes that I really love is the hiss and I was just talking with someone a couple days ago and I I don't think that uh, I definitely did this I did, well, I definitely didn't do it consciously, but I got really into using, I, ended, I made like a whole piece 
uh, years ago called Medusa that was all tape manipulations of tape hiss and uh, uh, just blowing out tapes. And, and uh, I, I was talking to someone recently and I'm, I'm like, I think what that came from was listening to punk tapes when I was a kid like misfits bootlegs and it was so hard to get hold of uh, like I grew up in this little farm town and so you'd have to well by the time a tape I could get my hold of a tape it was a dub of someone's older sister's a dub of tape tree yeah and like the these country. these old misfits tapes were just c- layers and layers of tape hiss and I came to like that's how I knew the songs so when like those all got remastered in the you know, early 2000s or late 90s or whatever, it just, it didn't sound right to me. And I'm like, I wonder if that's why, I, you know, I just always really, uh, I list, that's how I listen to all my music. There's a similar thing in the UK where people often sort of seem to fetishize the sound of pirate radio to a degree and hark back to that a bit because I guess, again, it was how they heard the music in the first place. And, you know, it's this sound you know, it's the sound of the medium, right, isn't it? And so people are, uh, people are in love with the medium and they can't, it just becomes part of how they experience and think about the music, I guess. But, mm-hmm. but tape is such a beautiful sound, it's a mixture of just randomness and, you know, distorted warmth, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah. Okay, there might be some tape heads in the audience who might want to ask something. Uh, if you, anyone... I can't see that well because it's pretty bright lights, but if you want to ask Aaron Dillaway something, I'm sure he'd be really happy to try and answer it anyway. I'm sorry? Um, you just need an 8-track player that records. They don't have any, like, tab or anything. for a, Yeah, you just... Yeah. Hmm. I don't. Yeah. And with sort of the mini tape cassettes, as he says, you've got this little tab you need to ca- cover yeah. over. With, with eight tracks, is it just a case of you know slamming the eight track in, and as long as you've got the recording eight track device, you can pretty much record on anything. Yeah. Yeah. But you haven't you haven't gotten it to work. Is that what you're saying? Like, Hmm. I mean, that could be a maybe a broken machine. I've never come across one, or maybe the maybe uh, it's a radio cart machine. Is it a radio cart, or is it an actual eight track? Hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> so you've just got an eight track machine. Yeah. Have you managed to find plenty of things to play on it and stuff like that? What more do you need? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, that's, you just get some foam and uh, cut it out and pop it in. Yeah, yeah, unless you get a Learjet 8-track, those are just, they're built like mini little tanks. Really. A Learjet? Yeah, Learjet were one of the first companies to make 8-tracks and 8-track uh, machines, and their 8-tracks their are just, you you try to pull them apart and you'll just break the whole thing. Okay. But uh, one thing, I, I, like eight tracks were really big in the States and one, a big thing with them was, uh, was bootleg, truck stop bootleg eight tracks. And I've kind of become obsessed with collecting, uh, there were a lot of like sound alike uh, tapes that would come sure. out and it'd, you know, say David Bowie and then real small like as performed by not yeah, the no. original artist. Yeah, and they're just, they're incredible. Like, the, you know, some are just awful covers, just which are usually the best. But the worst are the mediocre ones where they, it, I mean, it actually just sounds like Fleetwood Mac or something. But you'll get ones that are, uh, you know, they're just these session bands who would have to crank out. You know, today we're doing, you know... Uh, Man, that's a canny scam, isn't it? Yeah. you're stuck at a truck stop or something. <laughs> You want to hear something or something, and so you have to buy, you're forced to buy this, you know, David Bowie 
Yeah. I found there's, there's one called Delmar Soundalikes, and they even have a whole blurb on the back on how, you know, rich people can afford the real thing, but here, you know, you know. Uh, and it's like, and sometimes they'll even surpass the originals, and then you pop it in, and it's, you know, awful covers of Rod Stewart that sound like, I don't know, there's some really good ones. We had our own thing over here, which is sort of similar, which is Top of the Pops records. I don't know if you've ever run across those, but that, again, it's pe- the non-original artists performing stuff. And a, re- a really, really good one is uh, this version of Crazy Horses by the Osmonds. Oh, wow. And of course, they don't have any synthesizers. They just have to get all the people in the studio going, woo! <laughs> That's a wow. favorite. Yeah, one of the craziest is, a, is a one I got called Tribe, Sing and Play the Hits of Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison. And it actually has them doing a cover of Yoko's Why on it, which is just, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's, more, it's more insane than the original one. That's, uh, that's genuinely really fascinating. <laughs> it always sounds sarcastic when I say that, it's, it's, uh, genuinely. Anyone else like to ask a question for Aaron Dilloway? Not quite, no. <laughs> um, we'll, see, we'll see what mood I'm in at the time. Um, I usually have a bit of a, a skeleton uh, in my head of, of what I'll be doing. I have, I have a set of uh, record, pre-recorded eight-track c- cartridges that I m- may or may not use that I'll have at my disposal. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, lately, I've been doing, um, well, I'm at, a, I'm at a strange point because I'm kind of finishing up a record right now, which is basically kind of what the set I was playing on that Luff uh, festival. I kind, of, I kind of work live, I kind of write my stuff by, by playing live, and then I'll kind of put these records together uh, after you know, a few months or years of, of playing the material live. And then so I'm kind of at a midway point where I haven't quite finished my record yet, so I'm still kind of in the headspace of, of this older stuff, but I'm also kind of moving forward and ready to move into the next thing. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure. We'll see. It's, it happens a lot, but yeah, it's not, it not always, no. It's, it's, uh, it depends on the, the sounds that are coming out, and, and uh, I kind of, it's kind of a, uh, yeah, it just, it, it, it really depends on how, th- how the things start building together. Thanks for the cool questions. Um, we, uh, I think we're running out of time, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, give Aaron Dilloway a big hand. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks.